Hello and welcome to the Archbishop's Corner. This is where we meet each week to talk with Hartford Archbishop Leonard Blair about faith, morals, the life of the church today, and how the gospel makes sense in an ever-changing world. This is where we go to find the answers to our lingering questions about the teachings of the church, living the faith life of a Catholic in contemporary society, and developing a stronger relationship with God. I'm Father John Gatzak, with many questions that you and I will ask Archbishop Blair as he responds to what matters to you in the Archbishop's Corner. Bad is not going to leave you alone just because you are a good person. Bad makes its living trying to make you forget about what is good. Bad doesn't care that you go to work on time, give to charitable organizations, and help old ladies across the street. Oh, no. What you call bad times, bad experiences, and sometimes bad people are going to find their way into your life. The following is an encore presentation of the Archbishop's Corner. This program originally aired on February 9, 2020, on the fifth Sunday in Ordinary Time. If you have a question for Archbishop Blair, you can submit that question by email to archbishop at wjmj.org. Archbishop Blair welcomes your question. Once again, that email address is archbishop at wjmj.org. Now, we hope you enjoy this encore presentation of the Archbishop's Corner. It's here in the Archbishop's Corner where Archbishop Leonard Blair reminds us to put on faith to face the bad. So thank you, Archbishop Blair, for sharing your time and welcoming us into the Archbishop's Corner. How are you? Very well. Anything occupying your time since last we met that you'd like to share with us? Here we are, um, you know, right in the middle of February already. Well, I know I have to confess the time is passing very quickly. It seems like it was just uh, New Year's, you know. Yeah, true. But, um, no, there's nothing startling going on at the moment. Well, today is World Marriage Day, and it's a day that honors husband and wife as the foundation of the family and the basic unit of society. It salutes the beauty of their faithfulness, their faithful sacrifice, and the joy in daily married life. In recent years, more and more marriages have been taking place outside the church. Why do you think this is? And and, and do you have any ideas what we could do to bring people back and that young couples celebrate their commitment to each other through a sacrament, through the sacrament of matrimony? Well, I think we have to put it in perspective. This is not to make excuses or minimize the difficulty, but this is not just a Catholic problem. Uh, so when we talk about the great decline in Catholic uh, uh, marriages, uh, yes, it is startling, and it's but it's connected to so many other things, and it's also connected to uh, the falling off of marriage in general. Um, and I think it's because, well, you know, all the things that have been permitted, uh, particularly no-fault divorce, uh, and the fact that um, life today for a lot of people uh, doesn't have stability, and they wind up being afraid to make a permanent bond of marriage. You know, it takes a great act of faith and courage to be married to a person uh, in sickness and in health and good times and bad until death do us part. Uh, That's quite a, a promise. And it's one that I think a lot of people are afraid of. So, you know, uh, I think all we have to do is uh, always sing the praises and uphold the uh, the beauty and the value of uh, of marriage as we believe it to be instituted by God between one man and one woman for life, open to the gift of uh, new life and children. And uh, we're not going to get anywhere by condemning people who mm-hmm. don't believe that. But we have to, um, uh, and of course, the real source of all this is family life. You know how young people are raised by their parents to believe that this is that this really is true. What what we're saying. And I'm wondering too. You know, obviously, if you ask any couple that's been married for any length of time, fifty years or more, and and what it takes to make the marriage work, and they're going to tell you it takes work. It takes a commitment to the other person. There are difficult times in any relationship, but if if you're committed, if there's love there, and you work at it, you work at it, it will work out. I'm not so sure that people enter a marriage with that idea 
It's supposed to be the white picket fence, you know, with the lawn perfectly manicured and everything going so super well day by day. And when it doesn't, and when there's a bump in the road or when there's any kind of minimal challenge to that kind of daily living, they immediately surrender and say, well, this is not going to work for us. Well, it's true. And people have their middle life crisis, you know, and they begin to question things. And well, it's just, you know, it's the human condition. Yeah. And it used to be that the, the, the society and the extended family and the faith held it together. And uh, yes, I, I'm, I won't hesitate to use the word coercive. One was in a certain sense coerced to stick it out because divorce was not uh, accepted uh, because the family said, how can you possibly do this to the to your children and the family and you know, and all that kind of thing. But coercion, maybe that's not the right word, but it, it's, I, I should say it provided a support system to stick it out and to uh, be faithful. But when you live in a society as ours that you're free to do whatever you want, anytime you want, and there's no stigma attached to telling your spouse of 20 years that you've got a new boyfriend or girlfriend or you feel you need to start a new life, and so you walk out on your spouse and your kids, there's no penalty to be paid for that in our society today. There's no, nobody's going to tell you, or very few people are going to tell you, that you're not free to do it. Then that becomes another matter. So, you know, and I've always said there are people who are divorced who are in very sad situations where you can understand why they why they were divorced, but that is not the normal thing. The normal thing is is more just the decision that uh, this is not for me. But let's not dwell so much on the, the negative. I, I just, you know, obviously, as uh, Catholics, uh, believers, we believe that God gives a grace in the sacrament of fidelity, and that if a person um, really uh, is living a life of faith and prayer and trust in God, then God will give them the strength to, uh, you know, uh, be faithful. Uh, if people never go to church and never pray, well, on a natural level, uh, they might be able to uh, live a faithful marriage uh, for life. But it sure helps to have God as a partner in the marriage Absolutely. and to have faith and grace powerfully at work uh, in, in, in life. And that's what we want to encourage people to do. Prayer, the answer to many of the challenges that we face in our lives. And Tuesday, February 11th, is National Shut-In Visitation Day. Visiting a person who is shut-in can make a positive difference in that person's life. A person who cannot leave their home due to physical, mental, emotional reasons can become lonely and sad being cut off from the rest of the world. And sometimes they do not have family or friends that can spend time with them. I wouldn't be surprised to find out that some of our best radio listeners, for instance, Archbishop, are shut-ins. And I know for a fact that so many of our television viewers who watch the television mass are shut-ins. Do you have a a few encouraging words for shut-ins, Archbishop? Well, yes, that this uh, infirmity or this, um, uh, for whatever reason, uh, due to age or or whatever that that prevents them from being as active and going out as they used to, we, you know, uh, it's trite, but the old saying, you know, if God gives you lemons, then make lemonade. If, if you have a situation like this, there's no situation that's hopeless or that needs to be sad, that we can find ways uh, in our life through our activities and what we are able to do uh, to, to, to find a joy and find a meaning uh, and, and, and a helpful a kind of contribution to our prayers or, or other things that we can do. Uh, I do think that that's uh, extremely important. Um, and I think, too, of what Pope Francis says about the importance of what he calls accompaniment, that we accompany people. And so for a person who is shut in in the house and such, for another person to accompany them by a visit or by a phone call or by expressing some uh, concern for them, this is a very Christ-like, God-like, God, godly way to to accompany people, uh, to to show compassion and interest, and I think that's uh, that's important for all of us to do. And one of the things to to help shut-ins might be also to 
pick up the phone and call somebody else that you know. Rather than waiting for people to call you, how many times do people sit around and say, oh, nobody calls me, I'm all alone. Well, don't wait for somebody to call you. Call them. Call family members. Let them know you're thinking of them. Call other people that you know might also be shut in and let them know that you've been thinking of them, that you've been praying for them. You know, one of the things that a a lot of people do, Archbishop, and you may be surprised to hear this, but frequently people tell me that after they watch the television mass, they'll call each other and they'll talk with each other about the priest that just celebrated the Mass or the priest's homily. They'll discuss what the priest said, and they build a a small little community of people who who respond to God's coming into their lives through the television Mass, and they talk about this, and they generate more enthusiasm and interest so that they do, even though they may have celebrated that Mass, they may have watched that television Mass by themselves alone, at the end of the Mass, they pick up the telephone and they talk to each other. No, that's a wonderful thing. That's very sure, good. Sure. Um, Thursday, February 13th, is World Radio Day, a day to remember the unique power of radio to touch the lives, bring people together across every corner of the globe. And I would be remiss if we didn't remember and ask you to remark about World Radio Day since that's what we're doing. We're doing a radio program to reach out to people. What do you think? Well, like anything, social communications can be for good or bad purposes. Certainly what we're doing, we hope, will be very much for the good. And uh, we have to try to encourage in our society for that things be used uh, in a very positive, good way that builds people up, uh, not tears them down, and uh, keep that commitment. One of the first radio stations, Vatican Radio, was built for the Pope. Oh, yeah, Mr. Marconi. Yeah, Mr. Marconi did it. Friday is Valentine's Day, and most people focus on the love and the romance of the holiday rather than the celebration of St. Valentine, the Christian martyr. Do you have any words about St. Valentine, Archbishop? He's kind of not as as well-known as many of the other saints. Well, like all the martyrs, he is a witness to the greatest love, the love that lays down one's life for Christ and for others. And that's the, you know, the ultimate price, uh, ultimate gift of love. So it's appropriate, uh, I suppose, in a more religious way that uh, Valentine's Day be celebrated the way it is, uh, for, at least for those who, who appreciate that religious dimension. Let's take a look at the road to happiness in life, where we examine the wisdom of Pope Francis. I'll read a short portion of the Holy Father's address, and we'll ask you, Archbishop, to comment with your own thoughts. This is taken from Pope Francis's homily at the Casa Santa Marta, delivered on September 3rd of 2013, and it's called, Don't Be Dazzled. The Pope says, The light of Jesus is a humble light. It is not a bright light. It is humble. It is a mild light, a light with the strength of meekness. It is a light that speaks to the heart, and it is a light that offers the cross. If we, in our inner light, can be meek and mild, we may hear the voice of Jesus in our hearts and look fearlessly at the cross in the light of Jesus. But we must always make this distinction. Where Jesus is, there is always humility, meekness, love, and the cross. We will never find Jesus without humility, meekness, love, and the cross. He was the first to create this path of light. We must follow him without fear because Jesus has the strength and the authority to give us this light. Archbishop, your thoughts. Yes, well, I'm reminded by the Pope's words of the Transfiguration when on the way to his passion, on the way to the cross, Jesus was transfigured before Peter, James, and John on the mountain. And uh, they were dazzled, of course, by this brilliant heavenly light and the voice of the Heavenly Father. But then that passed very quickly, and when they looked up, they only saw Jesus again, uh, a humble, meek, on the way to a crucifixion. And so behind Jesus, in Jesus, risen from the dead, is always this glorious light. But certainly what the Holy Father says is true, that here below, with the eyes of faith, we always have to look with him with humility, meekness, and love, and the cross, that he doesn't bedazzle or overwhelm us, but he comes to us uh, 
quietly, silently, uh, uh, in, as St. Teresa of Calcutta would say, the disguise of our neighbor. Uh, he, he, that's how Christ comes. Yeah. So we have to have the faith uh, to recognize him in this way because the light is certainly there. And one day uh, in eternity, it will blaze forth uh, for us to see. But in the meantime, it is veiled and we have to have the eyes of faith to pierce the veil and to see Christ in all of these situations and in all of these people, especially our neighbor. Well, the Pope says where Jesus is, there is always humility, meekness, love, and the cross. But in our world today, where being meek and mild is interpreted as being weak, weak perhaps even in the face of injustice, how are we to interpret this being meek and mild? What is it? What, well, it's always been that way. The, the worldly, being worldly is no difference now than it was at the time of Christ's earthly life. Uh, there's the, the, the worldly wise and the worldly pomp, and uh, then there's the, the meekness of Christ. Uh, so we just have to uh, follow in his footsteps and do what he commands us to do. The following is an encore presentation of the Archbishop's Corner. This program originally aired on February 9th, 2020, on the fifth Sunday in Ordinary Time. If you have a question for Archbishop Blair, you can submit that question by email to archbishop at wjmj.org. Archbishop Blair welcomes your question. Once again, that email address is archbishop at wjmj.org. Please continue to enjoy this encore presentation of the Archbishop's Corner. Well, let's take a look at our Gospel reading now on this fifth Sunday in Ordinary Time, the ninth day of February. Today's reading is from Matthew's Gospel, the fifth chapter. And after the Gospel is dramatically presented, we'll talk with you, Archbishop, asking for your thoughts and what the Gospel means. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trodden underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. Nor do men light a lamp and put it under a bushel but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Archbishop, what are your thoughts on this Gospel of St. Matthew? Well, one of the things is uh, this notion that uh, truth is symphonic. There's many occasions to say this about uh, the faith. Uh, And another way of saying it is that our Catholic faith is not either or, but it's both and. That uh, there is a uh, in these great mysteries there are things that complement one another and I say that by way of introduction to this particular passage you know we're told that we should not let our left hand know what our right hand is doing Jesus says that we should not have a blow the trumpet before us uh, uh, to tell people uh, how good we are and that we're fasting and, and all this but in this gospel he does say, uh, you don't put a light under a bishop basket, so your light must shine before others, so they may see your good works and glorify your heavenly Father. So it's both and. It's a symphony of things. On the one hand, it's not about ostentatious pride yeah. uh, uh, about our good works, but neither is it about hiding them under a bushel basket so that no one can see them. But rather... Uh, We have to do both. We have to both be humble and unassuming, but we also have to let our light shine. You know, I think that's very important to have this balance in our spiritual life. Well, obviously, Jesus is talking to his disciples. He's challenging them to be the salt of the earth, the light of the world. But can these words be applied to his followers today? Can they be applied to archbishops and to priests and to... Uh, lay people everywhere. Well, they have to be. The gospel is uh, timeless. It's always, uh, these are not words of the past. They're Christ's living words to us here and now. He's speaking them 
even as we hear them so in we can, 2020. We can substitute uh, the first line of this particular gospel passage that says Jesus said to his disciples. We can substitute disciples with, with our own individual personal names. Jesus said to Father John, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light yes. of the world. Well, we're the, we're the disciples today. Yeah, yeah. Well, what then is he telling us about our responsibility? Well, that we do have a responsibility to stand up and be counted, to give witness to the truth of the gospel and to him. Uh, Jesus said, you will, all will know you are disciples of mine by the love you have for one another. So Jesus said, go out into the world and make disciples of the nations. So we have a job and we have a challenge and we have a commission and uh so that is the light it's not it's the light of Christ shining for others you know i i uh, use this example sometimes of the sanctuary lamp you know yeah. that uh you have the candle and you and you have the red glass that it's in and we're kind of the the red glass and really it, in our heart of hearts it's Christ shining in us and through us and so when we let our light shine Maybe that's the best way to understand that it's not about pride uh, or self-righteousness because ultimately the light that we show by our generosity, by our forgiveness, our forbearance, uh, that it's not our light, it's Christ's light. But we have to let it shine forth. This is a very positive message that Jesus is giving his followers. And it sounds to me like a message, a challenge that young people today like. Because it is affirming, it's energizing, it's enabling. Sounds to me like the kind of message that young people need to hear today from the church. Are they hearing it? And how can we do better in getting through to young people in the church today to allow them to realize that they indeed are the salt, they are indeed the light, and no one else can do what they can do, both for our world and especially for our church today? Well, that image of uh, uh, the sanctuary lamp, of the light of Christ shining through the red glass, we being the, the, the container, so to speak, the glass, and Christ in us, I first used that image uh, in a homily I gave at one of the World Youth Days in English. Ah. Uh, yes, it is very much uh, for our young people uh, because they want to do good. Um, they, they're idealistic uh, still, even in the midst of the world's great woes and temptations. And they certainly want to do what is uh, what will help others and, and build people up. But to understand that the best thing they can bring and the only true light that they can shine on all this is the light of Christ. And when they do these things, they are bringing his light to the world. Uh, and that consciousness of that, I think, makes a big difference. And I do believe that you and I, at the age that we're both at, we can still be idealistic today, too, and still believe that, that we have something to contribute in terms of being the light to the world and the salt of the earth, too. Huh? Well, I couldn't very well get out of bed in the morning if I didn't believe that. All right. <laughs> I agree. Let's take a look at some of the questions that have been submitted by our listeners. For instance, Nicholas from Canton says... When I was younger and attended Mass, I remember there being a weekly collection and once a month a monthly collection. Now there are two collections almost every week, and friends of mine in other parishes have noticed the same thing. Why has this changed? Well, Nicholas, I don't think it's good to nickel and dime people. I know in the old days they would have a regular collection, then they'd have a seat collection, then they'd have a heat, heating collection. It's about stewardship. If only our Catholic people, and I might add there are many Catholic people who don't need persuading and who are very good, but it's not about, it's about realizing from the get-go the importance of supporting the community, your parish, supporting the work of the larger church, and um, maybe pastors are doing this because they're finding it's a hard, hard struggle to make ends meet sometimes with, the, with parish life. Uh, but I would hope there would be a more radical way of engaging people uh, for stewardship than just multiplying uh, collections. Yeah. Sometimes you have to do it because there's a special collection, let's say for the missions or something that's taken up separately. Or to help the but people the in Par Puerto Rico for this earthquake that just hit, for instance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's no rule about this uh, that parishes have to take up all these collections. Yeah. And I'll tell you quite honestly, in today's 
world, uh, more and more people uh, contribute uh, through online giving and such. I think that's uh, very important too. Uh, important way to some of my charitable contributions. I'm beginning to make some of them online now uh, because it's so much easier. And uh, I know in our own uh, Archbishop's annual appeal, there's a significant increase in the number of people who are contributing online. And I think that's a very, very good way to, to do it. Ruth from New Haven says, Disney has released a new TV show, The Owl House, that has concerned some parents with its emphasis on witchcraft and demons. The show focuses on a teenage girl named Luz, who discovers a demon world and lives with a powerful witch named Etta, the Owl Lady. Luz disguises her identity as a human in order to survive in the demon world and attend witch school. For parents, what advice can you give regarding how to educate their children on the harmfulness that such shows can have on their spiritual and mental well-being? I well, must confess, I've, I've never seen the show, Archbishop. I don't know if you have. No, me neither. Yeah. Well, you know, there's a fine line here. Well, maybe it's not so fine. Uh, you know, the church has never condemned uh, stories and legends about ghosts and goblins and witches and such, as long as it's uh, child, childish or childlike kind of uh, imaginary stuff about, about uh, these things. But... Th- there is a line that can be crossed, however, and I don't know if this particular show or movie crosses it or not. It sounds to me, certainly, uh, you know, Ruth, you feel that it has crossed the line. Uh, but we do have to be careful about that because it's one thing to talk about an imaginary world of ghosts and goblins. Uh, it's because, you know, for, for children to understand that there is a spiritual, invisible world, that, that's good. Uh, and that there can even be uh, the difference uh, that there is a difference between good and evil in the invisible spiritual world, but if you start to uh, how should we say uh, delve into it or to try to make that uh, something particularly the the evil part into something more, then I think uh, you have to be very very careful. Doug from Granby says the papacy is usually in office that lasts until the Pope dies. But we had a pope retire a few years ago and a new one elected. Is it a good or bad thing to have both Pope Francis and Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI? Oh, I don't think it's a harmful thing. You know, the pope is pope as the bishop of Rome. And a bishop, we bishops retire. And uh, especially today when modern medical science and such uh, ensures that we live a very a long life compared to past uh, centuries and when but when that life sometimes is very hampered by infirmity or illness or weakness you know it pope if you've seen pictures of pope benedict the 16th he's very frail there's no way he could possibly uh, fulfill all the responsibilities of being a holy father so canon law makes provision for a pope to step down and then a new one is elected and You know, the Pope is the Bishop of Rome. Two of my predecessors here in Hartford, uh, Archbishop Cronin and Archbishop Mansell, are both alive. But they are former Archbishops of Hartford. And Pope Benedict is the former Bishop of Rome, former Pope. Uh, So, uh, yeah, there are pitfalls to it. There can be uh, dangers to it. But I don't think it's necessarily bad. Archbishop, can you conclude the program with a prayer and a blessing, please? Lord, we thank you for all your gifts and blessings. And as we strive every day to do your holy will, to love you above all things and our neighbor as ourself, and as we confront the temptations and pitfalls of of life in the world, we ask you to be with us, to strengthen us, and give us all the courage and grace we need to be your faithful witnesses, to be your light in the world today. And may Almighty God bless you all in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Archbishop, thank you for inviting us into the Archbishop's Corner. It's always a a pleasure to spend time with you and learn your thoughts on some of the many questions that have been submitted by our listeners. And uh, we look forward to being with you again next week, same time, 7 o'clock, with a repeat at 1130 in the morning. And until then, enjoy this week. 
You too, thank you. As we get closer to spring, huh? Huh, Much to be desired. (laughs) 